Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, uh, we're heading way back, looking into some really fascinating finds about Scotland's earliest inhabitants, specifically on the Isle of Skye. Yeah, it's quite a story. We've got a detailed scientific paper, Journal of Quaternary Science, plus a couple of news articles that really break down this research. And we're talking about a specific time, right? Like, way back. We are. I think around 11,500, maybe 11,000 years ago, the very end of the last ice age is sort of loosening its grip. Okay. So the big question is, who is actually living in what we now call Scotland back then? The picture's been changing. And this new evidence, well, it's rewriting parts of that early story. Right. So our mission here, for you listening, is to pull out the key stuff from these sources, understand why these discoveries matter, and, you know, try to build a picture of that time. Without getting totally bogged down in the jargon. Exactly. We want the aha moments, mm -hmm. the human story behind it all. These were the original settlers, after all. Okay, so let's dive in. The main focus is a place called South Quadrac on Skye. South Quadrac. Got it. The paper points out this site has... Um, the biggest concentration of late Upper Paleolithic artifacts found on Scotland's west coast so far. Late Upper Paleolithic, or yeah. LUP. And that period itself is significant. Oh, definitely. It's a time after the peak Ice Age cold when humans are innovating, adapting to these, well, really dramatically changing environments across Europe. And the artifacts themselves, mostly stone tools, I gather. Yes, yeah, stone tools are the main thing. And they're identified as uh, Arensbergian type. Arensbergian. Okay, what does that label immediately tell us? What's the quick takeaway there? Well, for you listening, the key thing is that the Arnsbergian culture is really associated with Northern Europe, Germany, Denmark, that sort of area. Ah, okay. So finding these tools here in Scotland at that time. Exactly. It suggests a connection, possibly a migration, from those continental groups much earlier and further north than maybe we previously thought. It pushes back the timeline. And the dating seems pretty solid. All the sources agree. Yeah, consistently 11,500 to 11,000 years ago. And crucially, this puts them right at the tail end of the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas. Yeah. That was that last big cold snap, wasn't it? Like a sudden return to Ice Age conditions. Precisely. A really significant, pretty rapid cooling event after things had started warming up. In Scotland, it even meant glaciers advancing again. That's the Loch Lomond Stadial. Wow. So these people weren't arriving in some kind of warm paradise. It was still a challenging world. Definitely dynamic, definitely challenging, which makes their presence even more remarkable, really. And who do we have to thank for figuring this out? The sources mention specific researchers. Yeah, they highlight the work of Professor Karen Hardy from Glasgow University and also, importantly, a local archaeologist, the late Martin Wild Goose. Ah, oh. Their groundwork, plus collaboration with other universities in the UK and even Australia, was key. It's often a team effort, this kind of research. Makes sense. Yeah. So let's paint that picture again. Western Scotland, just coming out of this intense cold. The landscape must have been totally different. Oh, completely. The news articles touch on this melting glaciers, yes, but also the land itself rising up. Rising up. Yeah, isostatic rebound. The massive weight of the ice sheets had literally pushed the land down, and as the ice melted, the land started bouncing back up. It's still happening slowly today, but it was much faster then. So they would have witnessed quite dramatic changes. Absolutely. The paper uses the example of Glenroy's parallel roads. You know those lines on the hillsides? Vaguely, yeah. What are they? They're ancient shorelines of massive ice-dammed lakes from that glacial period. So imagine people moving through a landscape where these huge watermarks were still visible features, a direct sign of the recent icy past. That's incredible, a visual reminder. Yeah. And it wasn't just the land shifting, the sea was different too. That's a really critical point, yeah. All the sources mention it, but the paper goes into more detail. Sea levels were much, much lower. How much lower are we talking? Significantly lower, enough that areas now underwater were dry land. Think about movement. The paper suggests... There might well have been a land bridge connecting Skye to the nearby island of Raze then. Wow. So islands weren't necessarily islands in the way we see them now. Exactly. It changes how you think about travel, settlement, finding resources. These lower sea levels are fundamental to understanding their world. Okay, so we've got these Arensbergian folks or people using their type of tools yeah. on sky, right as the climate is going through these massive shifts. Who were they, these Arensbergians? Well, based on finds elsewhere in Europe, the paper describes them as likely nomadic hunter-gatherers. Nomadic, right? Probably moving seasonally, following animal herds, reindeer maybe, other large mammals and gathering plants. Hmm. Highly mobile, adapted to 
pretty open post-glacial environments. And the journey to sky. I mean, from northern continental Europe, that's quite a trek. One article called it the ultimate adventure story. It really is something to contemplate. The most likely route discussed involves Doggerland. Doggerland, the land beneath the North Sea now. That's the one. Yeah. A huge area of low-lying land that connected Britain to the continent. It's thought they traveled across Doggerland, reached Britain, and then continued moving north, eventually making it all the way to Skye. Mind-boggling. That journey, the landscapes they crossed. Requires immense resilience, knowledge, adaptability. It really frames them as pioneers. And when they got to Skye, about those tools again, were they just using whatever rock was lying around at South Quidrac? Actually, no. And this is another key finding in the paper. They were specifically selecting and using a type of baked mudstone. Baked mudstone. Yeah, a fine green stone that's good for making sharp edges. And importantly, the source for this stone isn't at South Quidrac itself. It's found in Northeast Sky, near a place called Ancoran. Northeast Sky. Yeah. But South Quidrac is on the West Coast, isn't it? It is. So they were transporting this specific raw material quite some distance across the island. Which suggests... It suggests they knew the island's resources, they knew where to find the right stone, and they deliberately brought it to the site where they were living or working. That points to a pretty good understanding of their surroundings. So it wasn't just a random campsite. South Quadrac seems deliberately chosen. Why there? Well, the location itself seems strategic. The paper notes it gives good access to both the coast and rivers. Ah, okay. Best of both worlds for resources. Likely, yeah. You'd have potential access to fish, shellfish, maybe seals or other marine mammals, waterfowl from the coast and rivers, plus whatever land animals were around. A diverse menu, potentially. Makes sense. And wasn't there something about ochre, too? That red pigment. Yes, the paper mentions readily available ochre nearby. Mm. We know ochre was important to ancient peoples for decoration, maybe symbolic uses, possibly practical things like hide tanning. So its presence could have been another draw, another reason to choose that spot. It's certainly plausible, another factor making South Quadrac an attractive base. Okay, so a resource-rich strategic location. Now, there was another discovery mentioned in the paper, these stone circles at Sconcer also on Sky. Yes, Sconcer. This is really intriguing. They found these unusual circular arrangements of stones down in the intertidal zone, you know, the area covered by the tide. In the water. So how do they relate to the Ehrensbergian people at South Quidrac? Are they connected? Well, there's no direct artifact link, like finding Ehrensbergian tools at the Sconcer circles. But the dating is interesting. How did they date them if they're underwater sometimes? Through quite sophisticated modeling of past sea levels, combined with comparisons to similar dated structures found in places like Scandinavia, this suggests an age range of around 11,700 to 10,000 years ago. Which overlaps with the South Quidrac time frame. Exactly. It puts them in the same ballpark period-wise. And the fact they're in the intertidal zone now is the key clue. Meaning they must have been built on dry land. Precisely. When sea levels were lower. So, while we can't definitively say the same people built them, it's further strong evidence for significant human activity and construction on sky during this very early period. It really broadens the picture, doesn't it? As the news articles pointed out, this pushes the known limits of where people were living this early on. It definitely does. And the paper also mentions something else important. These aren't the only hints of Arensbergian presence in Scotland. Oh, where else? Isolated finds, single tools, often of a similar type, have turned up in other places. Terry, Orkney, Islay, Shield Egg on the mainland coast. Wow, scattered all over. Yeah, which suggests the population might have been more widespread than just the few known settlement sites imply. Maybe small groups moving around quite a bit. Could they have used boats between these places? Or was it all land travel? That's a really interesting question. Given the island locations like Tyree, Isley, Orkney, it certainly raises the possibility of some form of early sea travel or at least land hopping as coastlines changed and maybe more islands were temporarily connected or closer together. It adds another layer to that adventure story, but finding these places must be incredibly difficult today. Hugely difficult. The paper really stresses this. Think about 11,000 years of landscape change, sea level rise, drowning coastal sites, peat bogs growing over land sites, erosion. So many sites could just be lost or buried. Exactly. Many finds, like some of those isolated tools, have been basically chance discoveries found during farming or construction. Mm. It suggests there's likely much more out there that we just haven't found yet. But what we have found tells a powerful story about adaptation, doesn't it? 
living through the end of the Younger Dryas, that volatile climate. That's maybe the most compelling aspect, their sheer adaptability. Coming likely from different environments in Europe, they arrived in this northern landscape of mountains, ocean, melting ice, changing coastlines, and they made it work. It shows incredible resilience. It really does. The paper underscores this. They weren't just surviving. They were actively exploiting the resources, understanding the landscape. Like knowing where to get that specific mudstone from Northeast Sky. Exactly. That journey for the raw material from Ancoran over to South Quadrac really highlights that knowledge and intentionality. It wasn't random. They had a mental map, a plan. Okay, so wrapping this up, what are the big takeaways from this deep dive? I think first, the solid evidence for people on Skye, way up in northern Scotland around 11,500 years ago, people connected to the Orangebergian culture of Europe. Pushing back the known timeline for settlement that far north. Definitely. Second, their incredible journey, likely via Doggerland, and their amazing ability to adapt to this really dynamic, challenging post-glacial environment. They were true pioneers. Absolutely. And third, the hints of wider activity, the scattered tools elsewhere, those intriguing sconcer stone circles suggesting there's still much more to learn about this earliest chapter of Scotland's human story. It leaves you wondering, doesn't it, what really drove them to push so far north to the very edge of Europe at that time. That's the big question, isn't it? Was it population pressure further south, following migrating herds? Pure exploration, maybe a combination. And what else might be out there, hidden under the peat or the waves, waiting to tell more of their story? Precisely. It's a reminder that history is constantly being rewritten by new discoveries. The story from Sky is a fantastic glimpse into the resourcefulness and sheer tenacity of these early people. It really does make you appreciate the depth of history beneath our feet. That phrase, ultimate adventure story, feels pretty fitting for their arrival on Sky. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.